Welcome back to Z-Speed, and thanks for tuning back in. Today we're going to resume part three of our automatic to manual transmission swap on our Nissan 350Z. So if you're interested in something like that, just stay tuned. Welcome back to part three. As you remember in part two, we left off by removing the driver's side seat. So that would just give us a lot more working room to get in here and replace the automatic brake pedal and swap it out for a manual brake pedal, which is much smaller. And that'll give us more room for the clutch pedal. We're gonna be mocking that up next. And I found that if you remove the seat and you put a bunch of padding down here, or blankets right in this area, you can actually lay in here while you're kind of working uh, down there on the floorboard. It just gives you a lot more room to get in those nooks and crannies while you're uh, actually cutting some holes in here and swapping out the brake pedal because it's really tight with that seat in there. So take that out, it'll make it much easier for you. So now you can see I've got myself a nice comfy bed made up. So before we get started, now I'm going to show you something that's kind of neat that Nissan did that's really gonna help us out in the long run here. You can see here's our automatic brake pedal, but right here on the firewall where the firewall padding is, you can see a little cutout. Now, all you really have to do here is just grab this little tab or the corner of this little cutout, and all we have to do is just tear this out. It's really nice because Nissan had uh, pre-cut this area just in case this was going to be a manual transmission. All that the engineers would have to do is just pull this out and then they could go ahead and mount the clutch pedal. But if it was going to be an automatic, then that would just stay put like it's been for all these years. So all I have to do is just grab that, pull it out. And now we've got a nice preset template. We know where the clutch pedal or the vicinity of the clutch pedal is supposed to end up. That makes it so much easier for us to mock up this whole uh, clutch pedal assembly. So all we'll have to do is just place it up here and uh, make a few little uh, marks and we'll be able to mount this clutch pedal. So it makes it real nice and easy for us. So now it's time to remove the automatic brake pedal assembly and all we've got holding uh, this brake pedal assembly in is four bolts and a pin that actually attaches it to the brake booster itself. So we have to remove the pin first and all that's holding this pin to the brake booster is a small little metal clip. And all we need to remove that little metal clip is a little metal pick. So I'm just, I've got a little curved metal pick here you can see. And I'm just gonna put it through the little loop here on the, on the end of this clip and just pull straight down. So it's really easy. You don't have to be very aggressive on it at all. You just pull it down real lightly and it should slide right out. You can see it didn't use much force. So be gentle with it. And you can see now this pin will slide, but there's two little plastic ears on the very end here that are preventing it from uh, sliding out completely. So we'll have to compress those two little ears in. Now you could probably use your fingers tips to squeeze the ears in like this or uh, I think I ended up using a pair of needle nose pliers to just lightly depress those ears in. Then I was able to slide that pin right on out of the uh, brake pedal assembly. So just be real gentle. If you're too aggressive, you'll easily break those little ears off. So you don't wanna do that. And just take your time and you can get this out pretty easily. Okay, I went ahead and removed the four, either 10 or 12 mil nuts. I can't remember if they were 10 or 12. Sorry about that. But when you pull it out, you're going to rotate this whole brake pedal assembly to the left to get it out of here. You can't rotate it to the right. It's just not enough room. And you can see there's uh, their brake booster assembly right there. You don't want to rotate this thing at all. You want to try to keep this as straight as possible. You may have to move it a little bit to get the brake pedal assembly out, but try not to uh, move it too much. And now we can get rid of this big old giant brake pedal and get it out of our way. 
But before we toss that pedal out, we do need to take the two connectors from the automatic brake pedal and place it onto the manual brake pedal right here. Now you can see we have a black and brown connector here. This has four tabs in it on the black one and the manual brake pedal only came with two tabs so it won't connect up correctly to our automatic setup. So we're just gonna swap these out. So I'm just basically gonna replace both of these even though the brown one's the exact same as this one. Um, I'm gonna replace them both since my car came with the ones on the automatic brake pedal. Why not keep them both? And if you're wondering how hard it is to uh, replace these or swap these out, it's about as hard as this. You're just gonna rotate it counterclockwise like that, pull it straight up and out, and then you're gonna do the same with the other one and then place it back in and just do the exact opposite. So it's really that hard, which is not hard at all. So piece of cake there, and now we can move on to the next step. So now it's time to figure out exactly where we're gonna mount the clutch pedal. This is a 05 clutch pedal, but it works just fine in my 2004 350Z. So what I did was basically place this uh, up into the firewall area where we pulled that little piece of padding out and you can kind of manipulate this a little bit. You can go up or down just a little bit. I ended up making mine level with the brake pedal. That's how I decided to do it. Once I held it up to the firewall, I just grabbed a Sharpie and then marked this little bolt hole out. Then I came to the other side and did the same thing. So now we've got a little template for those two uh, holes that we're gonna need to drill through the firewall to bolt the clutch pedal to the firewall. So it ends up looking just like this. And of course you can go a little higher or a little lower. It's really up to you. As uh, long as you stay within this little area, you should be just fine. So next up, we're gonna need a one and a quarter inch large bore drill bit. These are called hole saws. Uh, Linux makes these and these work really well. They also have a, one that's a diamond tip. This is just a regular hole saw uh, drill bit, but the diamond uh, tipped work even better, but this one worked quite well for me. Uh, I think they're like 22 bucks, something like that. I got this at uh, Lowe's. And if you're wondering how I kind of figured out what size I needed, I took the, uh, this is an old master cylinder for our 350Z. And I just held the drill bit up to the end of the uh, push rod piston assembly area that goes through the firewall and matched it up as close as I could. You could probably go with just a little bit smaller. This is, like I said, this is one and a quarter. You could probably get away with something just a tiny bit smaller, but not much. And uh, this Linux cut right on through the firewall, no problem. So I would recommend these. But yeah, if you don't wanna carry your uh, master cylinder into the Lowe's or the Home Depot store, you can just take this little gasket that comes with it and put that in your pocket and then hold it up to one of these drill bits until you find one that fits just right. But one and a quarter did okay for me. And like I said, if you want to go just a little bit smaller, you can. Okay, before I use the Linux drill bit though, I'm going to make a little guide hole for the center of the Linux drill bit. And I'm gonna do that by using this gasket. I'm just gonna line it up with these two little dots that I placed earlier. And then I'm just gonna place a little dot right in the very center of this large, diameter hole and then I'll drill a little hole through that and then that'll allow my Linux drill bit to sink in the guide hole and it won't move around while I'm cutting. I'm afraid it might skip around a little bit and I don't want that to happen. So we wanna make this as accurate as possible. So using a guide hole would be a good idea here. Okay, I went ahead and drilled a hole in the center of this large bore hole that we're about to uh, place with the Linux drill bit. And now we have a nice guide hole so our Linux drill bit won't jump around because these teeth are kind of large. I'm afraid that it might try to move on us. The only problem I did have is that my drill was a little bit large for this working space. So I had to tilt it sideways. But once I tilted it sideways, I got a good angle on it and I was able to get the drill bit to line up just right. So this thing was pretty doggone sharp and it cut right on through the firewall with, with ease. And now you can see we have a beautiful hole for the master cylinder to fit through. Now, if you have a problem with fitment, you can uh, obviously enlarge any of these holes that you might need to. I had to enlarge uh, one of the holes myself to get it to fit perfectly, but you know, no big deal. 
Okay, now it's time to mount the master cylinder. Don't forget this gasket that goes between the master cylinder and the firewall. I also threw some primer and paint around those holes that we drilled in because I didn't want any rust to form in the future, so don't forget to do that. And now we're ready to go ahead and place the clutch pedal onto the master cylinder bolts. So I went ahead and did that without filming that part, but it's pretty straightforward. You just slide it over the two uh, studs on the master cylinder and then bolt them down. But we do need now to talk about reinforcing the clutch pedal because those two bolts alone with those two 10 mil nuts is really not gonna be enough stability for all the uh, force you'll be putting on the clutch pedal. So I wanted to show you I just what I did. I just fabricated a wooden block. I, I think it was like one and a half by one and a half a square wooden block I cut out because wood's really easy to work with. I may in the future go ahead and fabricate a metal uh, squared out brace to replace that block with, but this is just something to get me through so I could uh, bleed the clutch so that then I ran a uh, self-tapping metal screw of quite a long one right through the bottom of the clutch pedal assembly. That hole's already there in the clutch assembly, so I had to just drill a hole through that wood and then it self-tapped in to the uh, underside of the dashboard. And it's very stable. You can see I flexed the the uh, pedal and it, and it didn't even move. So I also made another little small brace and I attached it to this steering column reinforcement here. This is the brace for the steering column, but that's that 10 mil bolt right there and that sub was already there. So I just bent this little piece of metal right here and uh, attached it to the steering column and then attached it the other side to the actual clutch assembly here and that hole was already in the clutch assembly so I didn't have to drill that either. So I actually used a brace that was left over from the um, transmission harness. There's like three or four little metal braces that you'll have left over and this was one of them. I just put it in a vise and bent it right there, made a sharp angle, that 90 degree angle, and it fit perfect. I didn't even have to bend anything else, just one bend uh, to make it attach to the steering column area here. So, you know, save all your little leftover pieces from your harness and you can use uh, one of them. I'm not sure exactly which one this was, but there's only one that'll fit. Hopefully you'll be able to figure it out. Or you can just make your, fabricate your own piece of metal here to attach to these, this area. But this little thing really did reinforce along with this wooden block. Um, is very, very stable at this point. So I've got four points of attachment now. Okay, now it's time to place the reservoir on to the master cylinder. And there's two pre-cut holes in here. I've already removed one of the plastic dowel pins and I just need to remove the other one. And it just slides right in here and bolts up to this wall right here. So it's really easy, just two 10 mil bolts holding this thing on. So you just slide it in and tighten down the uh, nuts and you're good to go. And now we can just attach the hose from the reservoir to the master cylinder. Okay, I went ahead and placed the brand new hose and clips onto the reservoir to the master cylinder. I'd recommend that you at least place a brand new hose on here. You can get that from Nissan or from your local auto parts store. Now it's time to remove the rim and fender liner here on the driver's side so we can place the hydraulic lines from the slave cylinder to the master cylinder. Okay, now that the rim's removed, we can go ahead and remove the fender liner here. And then I'm gonna stop on the hydraulic lines and move over to the slave cylinder and place that on next. So what you need to do here is just compress this little boot on the slave cylinder. And I bought a brand new slave cylinder. You could also use a used one, of course. And you want a little bit of grease on the tip of this slave cylinder when you slide it onto the transmission. So put just a little bit of grease on the end of that so it won't squeak or make any noises and then we're gonna go ahead and place it onto the transmission. Now it's just held on by two 12 millimeter bolts. And if you're wondering where I got the 12 mil bolts, I actually got them from my local Nissan dealer. And what you wanna do at this point is hand thread both of these bolts in before you tighten them down. Once you get them all hand tightened, you can go ahead and torque them down there. Now it's time to place the clutch line on the slave cylinder that will run over to the hard lines from the master cylinder. Now I chose a steel braided clutch line here. You can use a regular one of course, but the steel braided clutch lines usually give you a much better pedal feel. I picked this one up from Z1 Motorsport and I think it was like 29 bucks, comes with a brand new banjo bolt and a couple of copper washers here. So it's really easy to install. 
So now I'm just going to hand thread this banjo joint down and then tighten it and we are all set with this end of the steel braided line. Now this other end just slips into this bracket. Now this comes already from the factory like this. Whether you have an automatic or a manual, that little bracket's already been uh, tack welded up here to the frame. So that's great. We don't have to worry about trying to source that bracket. It's already there. Now this is the inside of the wheel well with the fender line removed and you can see I've resprayed this down here. I found a little bit of rust so I sanded it and resprayed this whole area. That's why it looks brand new. You know me, I like to make everything look as clean as possible. But I wanted to draw your attention to this little rubber boot up here on top of the inside of the wheel well. This is where we'll be running the hard lines and attaching them to the master cylinder. So we're just gonna pop that little boot out and hopefully your new clutch lines or used clutch lines will come with a little rubber boot around it already. If not, you could just pop a hole through that little boot and use that as well. But mine did come with a little rubber boot, so we're just gonna remove that and then we're gonna slide our lines in. So I'm using an 0506 clutch line that you can actually separate into two halves, which makes it a lot easier to install versus the 0304, which I'm not sure that you can uh, separate that or not. But anyway, I've got the lower half here. I'm going to go ahead and place it under this area right here and attach it to my steel braided clutch line here. And I'm just going to loosely hand thread this thing in here. And once we get all the lines placed correctly, we can go through and tighten all the fittings to make sure nothing leaks. Now you can see that this thing's in there slightly tilted a little bit and to get that thing to straighten up and, and stay uh, nice and tight, there's a little metal sleeve that you're gonna need to slide in to this uh, little bracket. Now I don't actually have one because the one I got from my junkyard, I noticed after I got it home, it was damaged. So I had to go to Nissan to source a new one, but yeah, you could probably get away with a zip tie for right now just to hold it in place, but um, I went and picked one up later on from Nissan. Now let's come around to the inside of the wheel well right here. You can see what it looks like. We basically got three areas that we can bolt this to the inside of the wheel well. You've got these two holes right here, which will require some self-tapping 10 mil bolts to uh, attach to the inside of the wheel well here. And down below you can see there's a actually already pre-drilled a hole right there for that clip below. But I just want to show you a little closer detail. You can see there's two indentations right here in the uh, wheel well where you can attach these self uh, tapping bolts if you want to. I'm not sure if I'm gonna bolt that up, but I know for sure I'm gonna go ahead and bolt this down here since it's already pre-drilled and threaded. So I can go ahead and just thread this 10 mil bolt right in here and that'll stabilize the lower half of this hydraulic line, no problem right here. Now we can go ahead and get ready to install the upper half of this hydraulic line. Okay, so here's a little tip when installing the upper half of the clutch line, and it's to remove this whole plastic piece right here. This little thing, the little covering here that covers this whole area where the um, brake reservoir is and the actual reservoir for the clutch. Just remove that whole thing and now you have clean access to place your uh, clutch line right through here and pop that little rubber grommet in place. You can see it's a lot simpler once you remove that um, plastic housing. And you can see I had to kind of thread it in underneath here and then I attached it to the master cylinder right there. So then that was a little tricky, you know, getting it to uh, thread in there and then I tightened it with a small little wrench. I'm sorry about the blurry picture right there, but yeah, there it is right there. That little fitting right there, you just tighten it with, a, I think it was an eight millimeter wrench, opening wrench, and then I was ready to go. So I've got the top half done, and I got my grommet in, so let's work on the bottom half. Now, as far as getting all these clutch lines to line up 
perfectly. You will have to make a few slight bends, but be very gentle with it and be very careful. You definitely don't want to kink one of these metal lines or you'll have to replace it. So I just made just a couple easy, small, slow bends and everything lined up great. So then I took an open end wrench and tightened all the fittings so everything was nice and tight. And now we're all done placing the line in. Um, I decided not to use a self tapping screw at this time because everything was really stable and I just didn't see the need for it at this time. But you can if you want to. So now it's time to remove the cap from this reservoir, fill it with some brake fluid and bleed the clutch system. I decided to use this Motul Dot 4 racing brake fluid because it can handle a lot of heat. We're talking just under 600 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you want to take your car to the track, you can definitely take it there and not worry about this fluid starting to boil or anything like that. So, you know, think about what you're going to be doing with your car. If you're not going to be racing it, you could go with dot three, but it's really up to you. But I'm going to try this dot four racing brake fluid here. And a pint of this brake fluid usually runs between 17 to 28 bucks, somewhere in that range, not too bad. So now it's time to bleed the clutch. I made my own self-bleeding system. You can make them pretty easily for yourself. Uh, you can look up a YouTube video on how to do it if you don't know how to do that, or you can buy one at your local auto parts store. But I just cracked the bleeder valve on the slave cylinder, placed some tubing on there, and now that that's loose, I'm gonna go ahead and run the other piece of the tubing to a reservoir bottle. And now this reservoir bottle I'm gonna show you is way too small. You need like a half liter or a liter, but I'm just gonna show you the concept. Just drill a hole through the lid, make sure it's nice and tight around the tubing, and then a little air hole on the other side, and you're ready to go. And just pour some brake fluid in there so that, that it submerges the bottom of the tubing so that you don't suck air back into the uh, clutch system once you start to bleed it. But that's all there is to it. Make sure your reservoir bottle is a lot bigger than that though. Make sure your reservoir stays full as you're pumping the uh, clutch. Don't let that reservoir run out, otherwise you'll suck air back into the system. But basically just nice slow pumping on the clutch and you'll see the little bubbles work their way out of your uh, lines and into the uh, reservoir and once they all the bubbles are completely out of the line you're getting nothing but uh, brake fluid coming out then you can go back to the bleeder valve and uh, clamp that off with a wrench and then remove the tubing once you're all done so that's all there is to it like I said there's quite a few videos on how to do that if you're not familiar with it now that we're all done bleeding the system, now it's time to test it to make sure that we've got all the air out. So you need to get in here and use the clutch pedal and work your way through all the gears, all six gears and reverse. You should be able to access all of your gears. So just go through nice and slow one at a time and make sure that you're able to shift through all of the gears. If not, you may need to re-bleed the system until you're able to get it in, into every gear. So make sure that's set before we move on to the next step. Now we need to wire up the TCM or the transmission control module so it'll start when we fully depress the clutch. This is the little sensor that when you press the clutch down, it pushes that little button in and allows you to start. So there's a workaround where you can wire it so that it'll start whether the clutch pedal's in or not. We're not gonna go with that method. I think that's a little dangerous. So we're gonna use the switch. And first thing you need to do is access the power distribution module inside the engine bay here. So you'll have to remove the battery and there's a couple plastic panels right here that cover this area. We'll have to remove both of those. And once we get all those out of the way, then we'll be able to access the power distribution module a little bit easier. And it's this little guy right here, this one right here. We'll just remove this black cover right here and then we'll have access to all the wiring that we need to get to. So the good news is we'll only need to run one piece of wire from the driver's side compartment um, back behind the engine here and then over to this power distribution module. We're gonna be soldering it into the TCM 
transmission control module, and then that'll be it for the engine bay. We'll do all the rest of the work inside the cabin. So that's the good news. And so we'll just be removing this cover here, and then we'll access uh, the appropriate wire and splice in that little wire we're running from uh, the driver's side. So there's a couple tabs on each side of this cover. And before we get into which wire we're gonna cut and tap into, I'm gonna show you how to remove the cover. And basically you're gonna need a screwdriver on this side because it's real tight. But uh, once you pull those tabs back, boom, this thing slides right off. So what I was doing was unhooking this tab and this tab and this tab and that tab. So four tabs and the whole thing comes off. So there's two different configurations for the power distribution module and there's and this is a 2004 350z so i've assumed that it would be the 03 schematic 04 and then there's also a 04.5 to 06 schematic right here and i assumed that would be the first schematic but no guess what surprise surprise it's the 04.5 and up and this that plug right here in the lower right hand corner we'll be disconnecting that and splicing into one of the wires on this plug right here so i'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, the two different wires that you'll need to splice into in a second but this is the one we're going to be working with on my car so this is the power distribution unit again, and this is the wire schematic for an 03, early 04 350Z. And we'll be grabbing the plug in the lower right hand corner, that tall plug, and we'll be tapping in to wire number 43. And this is actually the schematic I thought I'd be using since mine's an early 04, but no, it wasn't. So if you have a 03, early 04, this is the one you'll be using, and it's wire number 43. So now this is the wiring schematic for the 2004.5 to 06. And this is the one that my car happens to have. And we'll be tapping into wire number 53. And you can see, uh, I'm gonna put a little circle around this plug. And it's not the one on the very bottom, but it's the one right next to the bottom. So that's what we'll be doing here. And if you have this configuration, you, you can watch me do it in real time. Now below, I'll leave you a link to this schematic. This is the 03-04-350Z schematic, and this is the 2004.5 to 06 schematic. I'll leave you a link for that one as well. And I'm also gonna be leaving a link to this YouTuber named Dylan Smith. He does a great job of explaining how to wire your 350Z. So between his video and my video, you should be able to uh, figure this out. And if you have any questions, just leave them in the comments below and I'll definitely get back to you as well. Okay, let's go ahead and disconnect the wire harness here. The tab's on the bottom part and you just press in and voila, it comes right out. And now we are ready to go ahead and strip the wire. So it's gonna be that little gray wire with the red stripe and it's right next to the orange wire. Okay, I went ahead and snipped the gray wire with the red stripe, which is number 53. Remember we talked about that? And now I've actually wrapped my little black wire that I'm running from my from the driver's side cabin area to half of the wire and I've neatly wrapped it around here as you can see and now I'm going to solder those two together first and then after I got that soldered together then we're going to go ahead and solder this piece right here onto these two wires so that will be our wire tap right there and then I'll cover it with some shrink wrap of course and we're all done with the soldering inside the engine bay here. But if you're not interested in cutting the wire, stripping it and soldering it, you could also try a wire tap. I've never actually used one on a situation like this, but it should theoretically work. So try that if you're not into soldering. So this is what it looks like after you solder everything together and place the shrink wrap on. Now all we need to do is plug it back in and then put the cover back over it. Just be careful not to uh, pinch anything and you're all done. Okay, for the power, we're gonna use a fuse tap that I picked up from AutoZone. You can see it has a space for a couple fuses to go in right here, but what I'm gonna do is add a little bit of wire to extend this, make this a little bit longer, so I'll have plenty of wire to work with. So go ahead and uh, solder your extension on there, and then we're ready to go ahead and wire the clutch pedal up. Now I'm briefly gonna show you how I got the wire from the TCM switch that we just soldered together into the driver's side and I removed these four 10 millimeter nuts 
from around the steering column here on this rubber boot. And then I just fished it through with a coat hanger right through here and then bolted it back down. So it comes out right here by the clutch pedal. So it's very, very convenient. And that's all there is to it. So there's other ways to run the wire, but this is how I did it. So here's the little switch that hooks to the clutch pedal. Once again, you have a gray and yellow wire running from it. So I will be soldering the gray wire to our power wire, which is the red wire. And then I'll be soldering the yellow wire to the one from the engine bay, that black wire. So that's what you're watching me do right now. I've already soldered the red wire onto the switch. And now I'm finishing the connection between the black wire and the yellow wire here. Okay, we're gonna access this little fuse box by the dead pedal, and we're gonna go ahead and plug in our antifuse right where that red circle is. That's the one I finally realized that I needed to use. Now, I actually also plugged it in at first up an accessory up here, up top on one of these, and I'll show you the clip of what happened, but basically nothing happened. It wouldn't start because power's cut to accessory when you turn the key, but the uh, one with the red circle is the one you want. Okay, I went ahead and mounted the switch back into the clutch assembly right here. So you screwed it in, it's pretty easy to do and you can adjust it a little forward or a little bit backwards, whichever you need. But you need to make sure that it's far enough forward that when you depress the clutch pedal all the way in, that it actually makes contact with that button and clicks it in and that will complete the circuit and then you can start the car. So make sure that you uh, get that situated just right so that it actually pushes that button. Um, and you can see I've tucked the wire back here, back behind the carpet, and you know, one goes through the boot by the steering wheel and the other one heads over towards the fuse box. So everything's ready to go. So let's take a look at the fuse box now that I've got the Adafuse set up in there. I just wanna show you what it looks like. Now I've got two Adafuse setups in there. You're only gonna have one probably but I have an air fuel ratio gauge and that's the one with the yellow fuse sticking out of it. And that's up in the accessory area up top. Now, originally I put the clutch pedal, which is right here, up there and it wouldn't start. And I'll show you a clip of that in a second, but this is now the correct configuration. The one with the red fuse, that is the clutch switch. And then the one up top is my uh, air fuel ratio gauge. So this configuration here works and just wanted you to look at it before I uh, start the car. Big moment. I've got everything theoretically hooked up. I mean, it's still up in the air. I just wanna see if it'll start. So, wish me luck, guys. Here we go. No, it does not work. Try number two. I've changed the location of the Adafuse to a place I know for sure is powered. So here we go. Couple goes. We're in neutral. Here is Johnny. Woo! Now let's talk about some of the issues you're gonna run into now that your transmission swap is complete and your automatic transmission harness is disconnected. You will no longer be able to use your reverse lights since the harness is disconnected. Your car will not be able to tell when you're in reverse. So that is an issue. You can do a little work around with the ECU. I haven't I looked into it enough at this time, so I'll make a separate video on that if I'm able to rewire those and get those to work. But as of right now, you're not gonna be able to use those. Now let's go over some of the codes you marked fine um, once you scan your engine. You know, I thought there would be quite a few, but luckily there was only just a couple codes that popped up on my car, which I thought was pretty nice. It was not, it was a lot less than I thought. Also, uh, as far as engine lights go, you're gonna get an AT. I'm not, I, I'm not sure if that's automatic transmission check or alternator right there, but my alternator is fine. So I'm assuming that's AT for automatic transmission check or check automatic transmission and then service engine soon light. Those will now always be on. So you'll have to periodically uh, scan your engine to make sure nothing new pops up. But you know, honestly, you know, that's still, once again, not that bad. So um, only other thing you're gonna run into is you'll no longer have 
cruise control. So if you're running a um, aftermarket tune and you use your cruise control to switch between the tunes, you'll no longer be able to uh, use your cruise control button at this time. So I went ahead and ran my code scanner and I finally got some codes that are gonna pop up. So let's go through them really quick. Like I talked about earlier, there's only really two codes. Now this uh, little device came up with seven different codes, but it was just redundant codes over. It checks the same codes over and over. So the first one is a U1000 uh, network communication circuit is, there's a problem with that. And then U1001, which is network communications circuit again. So basically, one U1000 and U1001, which are both basically due to the fact that the harness is disconnected. So once you disconnect any harness or you have a damaged harness, like I got a U1000 when uh, my knock sensor harness went bad on me and I had to replace my knock sensor harness, um, I got a U1000 code. So this is popping up because the actual harness is not broken, but it's disconnected. So it can no longer communicate with the automatic transmission. So that's why we're getting the U1000 and the U1001. So if you're wondering how it feels to shift the transmission, to say it shifts like a dream, is kind of an understatement. This brand new transmission is awesome, but of course you still have to break it in. Whether it's brand new or not, you should drive it around for at least 500 miles on the back roads. But if you're wondering if it was all worth it, I'm gonna say, of course it is. And one of the reasons is because I went to a transmission shop and asked the guys, you know, how much would it be to rebuild my automatic transmission? And they said, oh, that'll run you about three grand. And I was thinking to myself, for two grand, I can pick up a brand new six-speed manual transmission and have it swapped out. And they said, nah, nah, it's way too difficult. But you know what? We did it, we did it here. So if I can do it, you can do it. So you know what I'm gonna say now? Just keep on repairing. <laughs>